Before we get started, let me take a second to introduce myself. My name is Justin Cunningham, and I'm a director at Netflix working principally on data platform architecture. The data platform is composed of three parts, the big data platform, cloud database engineering, and real-time data infrastructure. The big data platform largely deals with data warehousing and the related compute infrastructure. Cloud database engineering deals with cloud databases, things like Cassandra and EVCache. Uh, and real-time data infrastructure deals with our real-time data infrastructure like Apache Kafka, Flink, and Mantis, which is an operational stream processor that we've open sourced. I work on the technical vision across those groups, and I'm going to be talking about the Netflix data mesh today. Uh, so the data mesh is our new composable data processing system built on top of Apache Flink. So let's dive in with some context. When most people think of Netflix, they think of the traditional Netflix streaming service. It's available from a huge number of devices. And in the stream processing context, we usually talk about eventing from the Netflix service. Events are generated as users interact with the Netflix service. So something like playing a show or browsing for content would generate these kinds of events. We built a self-serve platform called Keystone to facilitate this kind of eventing. Users can create streams and configure basic stream processing and syncs against those streams. This platform overall has been hugely successful for us. We're currently serving more than 150 million global members and generating trillions of events and petabytes of data a day through the system. Netflix has been transitioning to directly creating more and more content with the Netflix Studio, which has introduced some new challenges. I'd like to highlight some of what makes the Netflix Studio unique as that really motivates the data mesh work. Credit to Chris Goss, our Director of Studio Product Innovation for this analogy in the next few slides. The basic concept is that Netflix is the airport, the studio is air traffic control, and productions are the airplanes. Each studio is responsible for ensuring that it brings each of the planes in for landing. There's a lot of factors to consider to get them to line up well. Let's look at how this maps to some other studio models and approaches. So many other studios have organizational structures that have multiple vertically oriented divisions. So each of these child studios or production companies maintain their own leadership, hierarchy, culture, and technologies. They're kind of like self-contained businesses. Concretely, in the context of a business like Disney, Pixar, Disney Animation, and Lucasfilms are examples of child studios. At Netflix, we're approaching this as one company with big content ambitions. So we're making a strategic investment in creating a globally connected studio. So similar to the multiple aircraft types, we have many different types of content we're producing. Uh, anything from original series to local language originals, comedies, documentaries, animation, kids and family, and the list goes on. There are many scale challenges with operating like this that haven't really been tackled before in the industry. Consequently, productions today uh, sometimes fall back to the lowest common denominator of technology in terms of how they do business. So we're talking about a lot of paper and email and phone calls and Excel files and drives being shuttled around. Ultimately, we need to integrate production data into the studio at a somewhat unprecedented scale and across a wide variety of workflows. But where we are today is a lot less connected. We have a variety of data transport problems that we need to solve so the studio can continue to scale up production and so we can achieve the connected studio vision. Concretely, the data transport problems that we have are the following. The first is duplication of effort. So most of the ETL pipelines that have been created have been created ad hoc, meaning they were multiple versions of extract and load infrastructure that have been created over time, depending on what the exact use case was. Uh, next, there's a lot of delay in maintenance overhead that we see, uh, both in spinning up a new pipeline and then the ongoing costs associated with having it. Uh, so there's usually some exploration needed when spinning up a new pipeline to find or create a new connector, and that could be either looking around internally for something that already exists or going into the open source to find something. And then there's ongoing maintenance costs as the requirements change or the data source change requiring upgrades. Uh, next, there's uneven uh, best practices that have been implemented across these connectors. So what we found is that when users implement their own connectors, they may not follow the best practices for the data store. Right throttling, I think, is a great example of this. They also tend to only implement the features that they need immediately. So we tend to have a lot of 80% solutions that are floating around. Next is lower latency. So most of the data in the studio is being used for near real-time decision-making. So decision makers need a variety 
uh, of data points that give them a view of the productions that they're managing uh, as the production process progresses. So there's a significantly greater low latency need than in the traditional Netflix streaming business. And finally, correctness issues. Particularly around error recovery, not all connectors are created equal. It can be relatively challenging to get right, uh, especially when the user only has cursory knowledge of how the data store actually works. Uh, so if we can apply some expertise here, I think we get better outcomes. So there's the potential to resolve those problems and reduce overall complexity dramatically. This diagram shows the overall architecture of the data mesh in the context of ETL. On the left, you have data sources, which correspond to the extract part of ETL. We take a fairly liberal view of data sources, including things like traditional relational databases alongside logging data and SaaS applications like Airtable. All data ultimately flows into Kafka in a standardized data format, which, where it can be processed by Flank. And that processing happens recursively, uh, so it can happen potentially more than once. Uh, with different processors. And this really corresponds to the transform part of ETL. After being optionally processed, the data can be moved into one or more data sinks. And a data sink, uh, kind of similar to sources, could include things like relational databases or web services or SaaS apps. And this, again, corresponds to the load part of ETL. One of the key features of this architecture is that it allows for significant reuse of composable components. Extractors, loaders, and processors only need to be implemented once, and then they can be reused. By investing in a robust intermediate format, we push complexity out to the edges where data needs to be transformed into or out of the intermediate format for a specific data store. This ultimately enables any source to work with any sync and any stream processor, so you're really able to compose these components, mixing and matching them to produce uh, kind of any kind of data movement and any kind of processing. This is a more concrete version of the previous diagram. It breaks out a few more of the components. Source connectors on the left are responsible for extracting data from a data store and publishing it to a stream in the intermediate format. In our case, that's Apache Avro. Sync connectors on the right are responsible for loading data from a stream into a data store, transforming it from the intermediate format into whatever format the data store expects. Concretely, for something like MySQL, that could be transforming it from uh, a Avro message into an insert statement. Streams are stored in Kafka and are coupled with a catalog of schemas. We chose to extend the open source Confluent schema store and we've standardized on Avro for the intermediate data format. I'll get into Avro a little bit more later. Stream processors process data from one or more streams and place the data back into a stream where it can be processed by sync connectors or stream processors. So again, this process can happen multiple times and it can be done recursively. One thing that I wanna make clear is that stream processors and sync connectors are really both flank jobs underneath. So from a platform perspective, the capability that we need is to be able to deploy a flank job that can read from one or more streams and optionally write out to streams. There's a lot of similarity between the two job types. Source connectors tend to be a bit different because in some cases they need to be cut tightly coupled to the data store. For example, our Cassandra source connector has a sidecar that operates on the Cassandra nodes, then we do some output post-processing in Flink. As a general rule, I think it makes sense to deploy source connectors on, alongside data stores as an atomic unit, but to treat stream processors and sync connectors both as deployable jobs that are managed by the platform. For stream processors and sync connectors, we, the intent is to make them pluggable in our platform so they can be contributed by any team at Netflix. Ultimately, this is what will let us scale. We want to be able to create generic processes for any kind of common processing patterns like joins or SQL execution. And we do want to cover every data store at Netflix, uh, you know, for, on both the source side and the sync side, ultimately. So next, I want to show a little of what the data mesh platform looks like today in a kind of pre-alpha state. First, this is a view of a basic pipeline, pulling data from a relational database source, feeding it through a GraphQL enricher, and then outputting it to Iceberg. Apache Iceberg is a Netflix open source project. It's a table format for huge analytical data sets and it powers the Netflix data warehouse. This particular pipeline is dealing with movie data. We're using CDC events, which is change data capture, to act as triggers, which cause movie entities to be pulled from GraphQL and transported into the data warehouse. 
One thing that I want to call out here is that we're really capturing the logical configuration here. We're hiding things like Kafka and streams from the user. We really just want to understand what it is they're trying to do at a high level. Here we see an early version of our schema catalog, which is presented as a list of sources that the user can choose to build their pipeline from. Here, you can see some of our pluggable processing patterns. As I mentioned earlier, we treat stream processors and sync connectors similarly, with the only real material difference being the number of outputs. In this screenshot, you can see some of the configuration for the GraphQL processor. The configuration of is dependent on the processor pattern. Ultimately, we're gonna to wanna to be able to present processor-specific UI so that we could do something like provide a SQL editor with syntax highlighting and code completion for a SQL processor. And this is the configuration for the Iceberg processor, which include things like database and table name where we want the sync to write to. What I wanna highlight here is that we're really trying to capture the user intent. Uh, we're not trying to capture like job-specific configuration necessarily. Uh, we're looking a little higher the level than that. So the data mesh UI collects configuration and that configuration lets us interject a decision point on the back end. We can trade off cost, performance, and operational complexity. Initially, we're trying to minimize operational complexity rather than optimize either cost or performance. In the future, what we might decide is to deploy alternative topologies if we have specifically specific latency targets to hit. So for example, we might merge multiple uh, processors into a physical, a single physical instance uh, in order to lower the cost. We also deploy some additional correctness auditing processors alongside the topology to detect any faults or errors in the system. Concretely, this is what we'd actually provision and deploy for this simple topology described in the last few slides. So the topology uses database changes to trigger the GraphQL enrichment processor, which fetches entities from a GraphQL service. Those entities are then written to an iceberg data warehouse table. So starting at the top left, the source database and the CDC connector are deployed together as an atomic unit. The connector is exposed in the data mesh UI, but the deployment is much more manual. We deploy audit processes alongside each source topic to check it for correctness. When we deploy the GraphQL processor, we're also deploying an auditor to check its output. And when we deploy the iceberg sync, we're scheduling a batch auditor to check the iceberg data. As I mentioned before, we're optimizing for operational complexity by injecting a stream between the GraphQL processor and the iceberg sync. This isn't exposed to the user, but enables us to isolate the components which are owned by different teams. We may choose to deploy those as a single job in the future, which would be better from a cost perspective, but at least for now, we'd rather uh, you know, take the cost hit in order to make it a little bit easier to run. One last thing that I wanna call out here is that we deploy separate instances for every pipeline. There's a single GraphQL processor, but we deploy separate instances of it running with different configuration in the pipeline. So you could kind of think of this as there being like a single code base and a single jar that we're ultimately delivering, but then we're running a lot of copies of it depending on what the individual pipeline configuration is. Next, let's kind of dive in a little bit into uh, schema evolution. At a high level, our overall approach is outlined here. Uh, the first thing that we should probably talk about is Avro. Uh, Avro is a great fit for what we're doing because of the separation between producer and consumer schemas in particular. Uh, it also has pretty strong integration into the streaming ecosystem already. Uh, and one of the other features uh, that we really rely on is being able to store schemas as data so that we can implement our catalog. Next, we rely on fixed input and output schemas for our jobs, which tends to reduce the complexity of the individual jobs. So when a job starts, it's running with an input schema that can't, it can't change, and it's running with output schemas that can't be changed either. All of that is uh, done when the job is set up. Uh, and that really removes any complexity around changing schemas uh, during the course of the runtime. Schema changes themselves are managed externally. Uh, so whenever there is a schema change and we need to do a, uh, make that happen, we end up redeploying the jobs with new configuration whenever we've made that decision. So most of the schema changes in the system are user initiated. For select jobs, we do enable automatic schema upgrades. In that case, the data mesh controller will automatically redeploy jobs with new fixed schema versions when there are upstream, upstream schema changes. Uh, for the most part, we intend to keep schema changes on a single topic, even if they're breaking for some processors.
I'll get into how we manage this in the next slide. There are a few exceptions for things like changing a primary key, which breaks some of our underlying assumptions, or changing the data type of a field, which is really difficult to deal with in most syncs. I'll also note here that it's always possible to generate a schema that can read all of the data in a topic that usually relies on relaxing constraints on some fields, like making them optional. So let's get a little bit deeper into how we're managing schema changes. Most processors don't opt into automatic schema changes, so when we initiate a schema change, we're validating that existing processors can keep reading with the schema they're currently using. This compatibility check uses the Avro compatibility roles. The data mesh controller is responsible for checking and any redeploys that need to happen for those processors that do choose to opt in. If there are processors that would break, we alert the user to this so they can update pipelines so they won't break. We do give users the freedom to force push breaking changes. It's their responsibility to use good judgment around this. So we intend to leverage consumer schemas to limit the fields that a processor has access to and depends on, increasing the number of changes that are non-breaking. For example, in our pipeline from earlier, the GraphQL processor really only needs the movie ID from the database change row, so it should be able to create a consumer schema with only that column. That makes any schema change that doesn't impact that column compatible. The last topic that I want to get into is how we're approaching the convergence of batch and stream processing. This is something of a long pull for us, so think of this as where we're heading directionally. There's still a lot of work that has to be done in this area. One of the first things that we're doing is creating schema compatibility and symmetry between Kafka and Avro and Iceberg. This is like some of the plumbing of stream table duality. Concretely, we want to be able to cast back and forth from a row to a record. That means that when we're storing data in Iceberg, we're also embedding some data mesh specific information like the Kafka partition and offset. Ultimately, what we want to be able to do is reinterpret a table as a stream. Before we get into that, let's take a closer look at schema compatibility. So I'm going to run through an example here uh, to demonstrate the concept of ID mapping, uh, which I'll get into in a second. So let's start with a simple person table uh, with three columns, ID first and last. In the top left, you have the Avro data mesh topic schema. And in the top right, you have the physical S3 storage that corresponds to that. In the bottom right, you have the logical representation of the S3 data in Iceberg. The thing we're looking to do is add an ID-based mapping layer. Ordinarily, Avro tends to use name-based mapping, and our data warehouse data used position-based mapping. This made renames in particular really challenging to implement. In ID-based mapping, columns are primarily designated by an ID which can't change, and that ID is mapped to a name which can change. I'm going to step through a few examples of schema changes to make this more concrete. First, I added a city column, uh, and I'll flip back and forth a couple times so you can see what the change here is. Uh, so what I ended up doing, and what you can kind of see here, is that uh, when the city column was added, you have a new ID that was created of four in the Avro data mesh topic, and then that also flowed into the physical S3 storage. Uh, and what hasn't happened yet, it hasn't been exposed inside of Iceberg. So the table structure that's actually in Iceberg is still the same as it was before. What's exposed to users in the data warehouse is still the same as it was before. But in physical S3 storage, we started writing this data. The next step is to actually expose that data in the logical layer. So I'll flip back and forth a few times so you can see that. Uh, so now we have the ID of four showing up in the logical layer. Nothing has changed physically. We're still streaming the data in in the same place but you can start to query that data. The next change I'm going to make is a rename. So I renamed first to first name and last to last name. So I'll flip back a few times so you can see what's going on here. The thing that I wanna highlight here is that the uh, IDs that are stored in physical S3 storage are exactly the same as they were before. Uh, so we, there was no change to the physical layer. What we did do is add another logical table. Uh, so because of this ID-based mapping, the names can be really anything. Uh, so what we could potentially do here is introduce something kind of like a view uh, where we could potentially have multiple mappings to the same physical data. Uh, and in this case, what I'm, what I'm trying to demonstrate is that you could potentially have users that are still querying the data with the old table structure uh, and then move them to the new table structure gradually, but it's all the same data. Uh, and here what I ended up doing is I dropped the last name and I added uh, a new column called last. 
so last name previously was ID three. And I dropped that one and I added a new ID five. So at the physical S3 storage layer, what you'll notice is that uh, the only thing that's changed here is that we've appended an additional column uh, with an ID of five. And in the logical iceberg layer, we added yet another table, uh, this time representing the new structure. But queries against the other should still work. What we've basically done here is relax the constraints on uh, co ID column three to make that optional now. So this is illustrative. In practice, we probably want to restrict schema changes based upon downstream usage. I wouldn't really recommend doing something like this. Uh, the key insight is that it's only possible, is really the only possible change at the physical S3 layer is the addition of columns or relaxing of constraints to make the previously added columns optional. The data that gets physically written always matches the underlying Avro schema. We're able to represent any schema change this way, and it gives us full compatibility between Avro and Iceberg. Lastly, we're looking at dull sourcing from Iceberg and from Kafka. So this will allow us to treat Iceberg tables as longer retention Kafka topics. There's a variety of use cases for this, particularly around bootstrapping of state and backfilling. Uh, in addition to that, I kind of think that we will be able in the long run anyway, uh, to tune down the retention on some of the Kafka topics if we can rely consistently on being able to pull the data out of Iceberg. The belief is that overall, if we can align the data formats and align the data reading capability so both can be treated the same, we can ultimately converge batch and stream processing. The next logical step for us after this is likely a SQL abstraction as that would align our data processing capability. On a final note, if you're interested in working with our exceptionally talented real-time data infrastructure team solving these kinds of hard problems, please reach out. We're actively hiring still. Uh, Netflix has a really unique culture. It's a great place to work, and we have a lot of work left to do. My email is jcunningham at netflix.com. Definitely feel free to reach out to me about this or any other questions. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you.